The first presenter is going to be Dr. David Willscroft. So Dave graduated from the St. Paul's Emergency Medicine Residency Program in 2004 and completed a fellowship in hospice and palliative care at Stanford University in 2014. He divides his clinical time between emergency medicine at Lionsgate Hospital in North Van and palliative care at St. Paul's Hospital in Vancouver. Areas of interest include palliative care in the ED, POCUS for palliative care, and pre-hospital palliative care delivery. So please welcome to the podium, Dr. Dave Wellscroft. Okay. Can everyone hear me? Cool? Okay, hey, thanks, Rob. Okay, so I've got the sexiest topic of the entire conference, so thank you for coming. Uh, I've got no disclosures, but I do think I may run into a little bit of trouble tonight with some of the medical legal stuff I'm going to bring up, and that I may not be able to answer the questions, so be patient with me, because it may get a bit controversial. So here's my ambitious uh, outline. So we're going to talk about some medical legal trickery that we run into uh, in the emergency room when we're dealing with sick, acutely ill, um, adult patients and we think we want to do something with them and they think differently or their family thinks differently so we're going to talk about that number two which i hope is the big takeaway is to leave the room with a framework for a three-step process in coming up with a way to give recommendations um, compassionately and then if i have time i'm going to talk briefly about simulation for this which sounds a bit weird but we're going to talk about it hopefully so again, I'd like to thank the planning committee for giving me the best talk topic, Brian Lehiff, um, for this year, because elder care is sexy, and we're going to go right into it. So has anyone heard of this term? Fanatophobia. Anyone? No? Because I think we deal with it almost every day in the emergency department, and that is not necessarily a feeling of death, but this feeling of dread and apprehension around, and anxiety around dying or things are changing. So we deal with that. We feel it, our patients feel it, the families feel it. So this is something um, that I think is good to recognize. So I'm gonna talk about a case. This is a case from uh, September for me. So it's a fresh case uh, that I saw in the eMERGE. So a 69 year old male, uh, diagnosed more than 10 years ago with Lewy body dementia. Um, and he's actually done quite well because he has great care from his wife who supports his care in long-term care. So past medical history is also significant for metastatic lung CA, mostly with bone mets, not brain, not liver. Um, but the chief complaint in the eMERGE was fever, delirium, hypotension, hypoglycemia, and he had an aspiration event that was witnessed um, that was quite significant. So one of the key tricky parts of this was that he had a DNR in place. He had a transfer essentially in our health authority for DNR2. So if he needed a laceration repair or a hip fracture fixed, he'd be brought in. Uh, but otherwise, he was to stay for care at his facility. But the son from California, when he learned of the deterioration, uh, asked for an override or demanded an override of the DNR, and the patient was brought in. So when I saw this man, he looked awful. So he looked like he was dying, very frail, very cachectic, very hollowed out, very sick. So these are his vital signs, just to get a sense of what he looked like. So very hypotensive, tachycardic, febrile, hypoxic, tachypnic. Um, GCS 10, I think that's hard. I didn't measure that because I think that's hard in a dementia patient a bit. Um, hypoglycemic. He did mount a white count, which was good. Uh, quite a white count, though. High lactate. Um, hyponatremic, I think that that was probably actually from a different process with his cancer. And he had troponitis. And he had a bilateral infiltrate uh, in his chest x-ray consistent with aspiration. So this is what I got on the phone. Literally from the sun. Has anyone ever heard this before? <laughs> totally. Has anyone not got quite upset inside when they heard this on the phone before? It's quite upsetting 
to get this if you don't think that that's the right thing to do. So one of the tricky parts in the emergency department is that we need time to be able to communicate an effective plan. And time is something we don't have. We all have different environments in the emergency department, uh, but we all suffer from some time pressure. And in order to communicate an effective plan, you need time. So I'm gonna just give you a couple of hacks to make it time effective and time efficient. So goal concordant care is, is something to think about because we talk a lot about the goals of care for a patient. What I wanna talk about also is our goals. Like what do we think are our good goals for this patient's care as well as the substitute decision maker and the patient? So how do we get there? So I think everyone in the room, especially the younger half of the room, the newly trained, new grads, current residents, have heard about shared decision making, okay? I think shared decision making sounds great, it sounds ideal, uh, but what does it really mean and how do we do it effectively in the ED? So this is what shared decision making, the definition is, so it's, a, it's an interdependent, interpersonal dialogue so that the physician team and the patient and the substitute decision maker get to know each other. I mean, it sounds wonderful, but it, it, does it doesn't really happen in the eMERGE effectively. So just to back up a bit, these are our roles in shared decision making. And I think when we're trained in medical school and residency, autonomy historically has still been the key for, for our patients, okay? So, but what is our role? So we wanna share medical knowledge and experience, if you've got experience. You may not have experience, but, but you're gonna gain it. So for the patient and the substitute decision maker, Disclosing the values and the goals, like how do you draw those things out? And how do you apply that to making this decision together? So that's what shared decision making is. What we do a lot, what I see a lot, I think a lot of us see, is in our dialogue with patients and families, we bring up the early words of DNR and code status quite quickly because someone's sick in front of us and we use that term or those terms quickly and what we do see is a sense of medical abandonment quite early, where people will reflexively often say, well, hang on, if, if you're talking about DNR already, I feel that my parent's not gonna get anything. So perhaps not go into, like coming in too hot with DNR. You kind of wanna know, actually you really wanna know, but how you get there is different. And then you've probably heard before, discussing withdrawal of care as a term, um, we use it all the time. Step down from ICU, uh, taken off a ventilator, we talk about withdrawal care all the time. Of course, the easy hack is saying, we're gonna transition you to comfort care. You don't even have to use the word palliative care, okay? Just comfort care, okay, but still care. So just try and avoid those. So this is kind of where it gets a bit tricky and we need to be up to date on what we're obliged to do because it's actually changed, okay? In Canada, this is the ideal, okay? So the patient has known wishes and we may not have an advanced directive for them. We look at the best interest of the patient and hopefully we can give a proper plan for that patient. So hopefully we can combine them. What does the CMPA say? It's kind of interesting and I got a call just as recently yesterday uh, from the CMPA about this topic to give me some up-to-date information which was more or less consistent. So what are we obliged to do? So it's clear that a physician must respect a capable person's known wishes for end of life care, for procedures and for treatment, okay? But the fuzzy area, this is on their website as well, is that it's unclear as to whether a patient or a substitute decision maker can demand a specific treatment. I'm gonna build on this. The Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons had something interesting to say. <laughs> where intractable disagreements are best viewed as arising from differing visions of what's best for the patient. So essentially, I think we feel differently about how to look after each other, okay, or look after you. I feel differently, we wanna get somewhere with your family member, but we have different visions of the best thing to do. Who here is from Ontario, trained in Ontario, practices in Ontario, okay? So you're well aware of this case, I think most of us nationally. Are you aware of this case? Yeah. So what I hear from some of the uh, fellows and residents who've moved out west to train 
is that this court case has affected a lot of practice, even outside, I'm getting a lot of nods, outside the ICU, okay? So essentially, this was a case of a withdrawal of care or a movement to comfort care. See, I even used it there, okay? Where the family did not agree with the intensivist and taken to court over futile care. And family won, okay, essentially. So what, what happens, and this is just for Ontario and Yukon, if there's a disagreement, you can apply to the Consent and Capacity Board as a hospital, as a physician, as a physician team. But that's not obviously across all provinces and territories. But I wanna make a key distinction here. This is one of the key takeaways from tonight is what is withdrawing versus not offering? This is really key for the emergency department, okay? Because they are different. Previously, they were not considered different, okay? So we need to talk about what that means and, and what are some of the case, what's some of the case law around this. This is a journal that was passed on to me. Um, it's, quite, it's quite a good uh, little article, actually. Um, and then the CMPA builds on this. So there is no case law in Canada that dictates that withholding or not offering CPR requires the consent. So just think about that for a second, because this actually applies to lots of things. You're not actually required to do something futile, okay? So physicians can ethically and legally not offer CPR. And how you do that is obviously very nuanced. It can be direct, it can be indirect. Hopefully it can be um, effective. This is a case that was cited in this article. Um, has anyone ever heard of this case in Ontario? Okay, this was a case of kind of the opposite, in a way, of the Rizzuli case. So, essentially, the Hamilton uh, Health Sciences Organization and physician were taken to court because the physician made a decision that uh, an advanced directive was not to be carried forth when it came to end-of-life care. The advanced directive the patient had was that there would be CPR, full mechanical ventilation, et cetera, but when it came down to it, that was deemed medically to be futile care. It was not offered, okay? Um, after the fact, the, the, the physician, again, was taken to court, and the court sided with the, the Hamilton Health Sciences and the physician, okay? So which treatments are to be offered is a matter of medical judgment. So this is an important takeaway, okay? So forget all the heavy stuff for a second. That's all negative, that's all stressful, that's all the stuff that we don't wanna do. What I would like you to come out with tonight um, comes out of formulating a recommendation, which is something we're not actually trained to do as well. You know, So this is uh, reflecting on a paper that I came across in 2018, really changed my practice and gave me a bit more credence into going through this process. So using shared decision-making model, can you be kind of paternalistic but come across as being compassionate, and you can. So this is the paper and the reference. I actually recommend it quite, I mean, it's only a few pages long, it's very readable, um, and, and I, it really changed the way I looked at things, and actually the way I teach. So this is this three-step process in this. So as a physician or a nurse practitioner, you evaluate the prognosis and treatment options, okay? So that's your role as a medical expert, okay? The other piece is trying to understand the patient and their priorities, okay? So that can be done through the patient, can be done through getting some collateral, either from family physician or family members and substitute decision makers. With those two pieces of broad information, actually come forward and make a recommendation if you feel it's appropriate and feel okay about it. Give some direction. Um, as I get old um, and older, I, I, I hear this a lot more about from my non-physician friends and family that uh, when their loved ones are starting to get sick and die, they actually consistently want a little bit of guidance. Okay, and I'm not sure if we're giving as much guidance as we're able to at times. So this paper actually reinforced that concept. And we're behind the surgeons. I found this awesome. So this is a journal article from the Annals of Surgery in 2016, 
which outlines this quite beautifully. So what's, what do surgeons do? If you've got someone with a malignant bowel obstruction, okay, frail, poor performance scale, multiple medical comorbidities, renal failure, you name it, ASA 5, like really, really sick people, they will rec make a recommendation not to go to the OR. I do not recommend an operation for your loved one, okay? And then they either carry on care or refer on for comfort care or something. It's a very concrete kind of decision. But what they say here is, it's kind of cool, coming from a surgeon. So you formulate a prognosis, you create a personal connection, you establish shared understanding, so you give the news, you make a treatment recommendation, and then you affirm ongoing support. This is actually a bigger version of what this article in 2018 said. So there's just one summary slide that I have, and this isn't it. But if you're gonna do anything, consider when you're in this difficult situation at work, giving some compassionate guidance. So it's not actually being paternalistic. You actually wanna be compassionate, but you actually wanna give a recommendation. And there's ways to do it, and a lot of it's about language, and there are lots of courses out there on how to you know, use proper compassionate language. Okay, there are a lot of courses in BC and beyond on this, and I won't pretend to give you everything tonight. So here's some examples. Would it be helpful after all this? Would it be helpful if I made a recommendation? Okay, would it be helpful? And then after hearing from the family and the patient, um, given what you've told me about what is important to you, this is what I'd recommend and feeling okay with that. And this article that I uh, referenced gives a few other examples and obviously as adult learners you can work with this if, if you think it's important. Um, no, I'll go back. So don't forget about empathy. So I'm sorry you're going through this. I wish it were different. Their physicians are notorious for not being able to provide empathetic statements when the obvious opportunity is there. There are lots of empathetic statements. Just even say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry this is happening. Just don't say, uh, I know how you feel, because we know that doesn't work. So when the son from California says on the phone, I want you to do everything, you can be as chilled as Ice Cube and say, I'm going to do everything for your mother that will give her benefit. And then the question will come back, okay, what does that mean, maybe? But they feel, or that, that son feels, that, that mom is going to get looked after, dad is going to get looked after, whoever that is. And you feel like you're going to give beneficial therapy. You're not just giving opiates and benzos and comfort care. You're going to do something. And I'll tell you what we did with this guy. So he improved a little bit, just with simple nasal prongs, not high flow. Um, and I offered a, a, a time-limited trial of antibiotics by peripheral IV. The wife wished for a brief admission, which was sensible, just in case he, in case he got hypoxic um, and could be monitored. And they accepted the recommendation for no mechanical ventilation CPR, uh, and the son did as well. Okay, so this is what was going to happen. I'm going to end up briefly with SIM for palliative care. And I think a lot of you are thinking, what? Why would we use SIM for palliative care in the ED? Doesn't make a ton of sense. I, I get that, but bear with me. So this is why it may be good, because I actually see, and I've done this before, I'm sure, in all my years of practice, to trip on your tongue okay, is way worse than tripping on your feet. So how do you practice not tripping on your tongue? Well, you do simulation. Okay, so we're not the first to consider doing this. We've started doing this out west, and we're going we're gonna to do it this year with our CCFPEM residents. Um, so there are some cases you can get online, and the University of Toronto has been doing this for a while, and it's proven to be effective. So I, I think it would be good to get a national program going where we share cases, because um, they've actually been proven to work. And that's the end of my talk. Just consider compassionate guidance the next time you are at work. Thanks.